We'll get going with the pre-show shortly. I'm really, really excited for today's session. And I know it's going to take people a few minutes to get organized and figure out where to go because we're so accustomed to having these webinars on ClickMeeting, which has been a great webinar platform for a lot of the sessions. But it was really interesting to me as a fully sighted person to see the bias revealed to me that these softwares, there's many great softwares out there, but not every software takes full consideration of different users needs. And so one of the reasons we did end up on Zoom today was to make sure that we have the functionality that our presenter and our guest is going to be able to um, share in a way that's easy for them in their presentation. So really excited for today's guest, and we're going to be talking during the pre-show this morning about the session we had on Monday, then I'm going to give you a heads up about the sessions that are coming later this week as people are trickling in. If you're watching this recording in the future, all of the webinars you can find from 2020 as well as 2021 are available on our YouTube channel. I'm going to post a link to our YouTube channel in the chat box. Feel free as you enter the Zoom this morning to let me know where you're located. It's really nice to be able to see the location of our different aquatic professionals around Canada, the US, get some different perspective about where everybody is coming from. So if you don't know, my name is Kitty Crysdell and my business is Lakeview Aquatic Consultants. We started these webinars back in 2020 when the COVID-19 pandemic started. And the goal of these webinars was really to bring together different aquatic professionals and provide an opportunity for training and professional development and networking and really that opportunity for connection back when the pandemic was new and really scary and many aquatic facilities were closed and we didn't know what the future looked like. So all of the webinars last year were um, a great success to me as a person because I thought it was something that a lot of our aquatic professionals really needed. When I was looking to 2021's topics, instead of selecting topics that were really easy to be presented, that were already prepared and had already been delivered by the presenters who were willing so graciously at the last minute to hop on and present, because keep in mind, this was the middle of a pandemic and people were taking two or three hours out of their week to come and present a session to our attendees. So I couldn't ask them to develop sessions. I asked them to provide sessions that they had previously completed. When I was looking at 2021, I really wanted to try and cover some areas where there's major gaps in our understanding as aquatic professionals. So in my work as a consultant, when I do facility assessments or I do coaching with different aquatic professionals, I see a lot of the same trends, whether it's in Alberta, Canada, where I'm based, or whether it's another Canadian province, whether it's Ontario, Newfoundland, um, Arizona, Texas, I have a client in the UK, a lot of the problems are the same, a lot of the pain points are the same. And so my goal with the 2021 pool aid webinars was really to highlight some of these areas that we need to address as an industry. One of the great things about offering a free series of webinars with no barrier to entry, no cost associated with it, is that I can program those sessions that we actually need, not those sessions that people want and that we'll pay for. And I think that is a significant disparity we see sometimes is that there are a lot of concepts that maybe are not popular, air quotes, or not trendy, or not perhaps relevant to everyone. And that's why with these sessions, I really wanted to pick topics that would provide benefit to either certain populations or certain groups, certain facilities, or are chronically deficits with the clients that I work with. So on Monday, March 1st, we kicked off the 2020 Pool Aid webinars. We had an excellent session. We had Caden Seaburn from the Ten Oaks Project in Ottawa. Uh, Ten Oaks Project is an organization that assists with LGBT families and especially trans youth. 
They provide a variety of uh, community opportunities, programming opportunities, including a summer camp when it's not COVID, including a trans swim when it's not COVID. And Caden delivered a really um, accessible session on Monday with a lot of strategies and easy to follow tips that I hope the aquatic professionals who are watching this recording or who are joining us today for the webinar that you can go back and look at that recording and really implement some of those strategies at your pool. Sometimes it's a big topic and sometimes people become overwhelmed thinking about all the things they should be doing, all the things that they want to be doing and that desire for perfection, we end up doing nothing. And so Cadence strategies looking at, um, you know, referring to people by their names, not by their perceived gender, looking at forms, paperwork, signage, basic policies, starting small and not getting overwhelmed right from the get go, focusing on small things that you can do, whether you're a lifeguard, a pool supervisor, the aquatic superintendent of a larger municipality, it all starts with us and small steps that we can take to improve the uh, conditions of our members and our users. So that was a really great session that we had on Monday. Coming up this week, we obviously have today's session, which is going to be uh, really, really great. I'll be talking more about it when I introduce our presenter closer to the hour, about 20 minutes from now, 22 minutes from now. Friday this week, we do have another session coming up. So all of our sessions are Monday, Wednesday, and Friday throughout the month of March. They take place at 11 a.m. Mountain Standard Time or 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we do have pre-shows and post-shows after each session. So you are welcome to always just join us for the webinar that starts a minute or two after the hour. But if you're interested in networking, getting to see other presenters or attendees, I should say, we usually do a little bit of a pre-show and, and talk about different industry topics. I think this morning, a lot of people will be joining us later, closer to the start of the session, just because we are on a different platform. It is a different routine. And, uh, you know, some days it just takes that, oh, shoot, I have to be somewhere to realize that, um, you know, I'm always queuing off of those phone alerts for me, which are 10 minutes before something starts. So this Friday session is going to be a little bit different. We're going to be talking about water parks on Friday. Let me put a link in the chat box if you're not already registered for Friday. You do need to register for each session separately, and that's just a privacy feature. So we don't mass email we don't take any data from any of our webinar participants and abuse it. We are very FOIP compliant. And so we ask that each participant, they register for each session that they are interested in. We don't mass email, we don't group email, anything like that. So the session on Friday is going to be called transferring practical knowledge from water parks to community pools, looking at water slides. And if you are at a municipal pool or a nonprofit organization like a YMCA or a Jewish community center, and you're thinking, well, I don't have the budget for a water slide, I don't have the space for a water slide, this is not a session that applies to me. Ryan Jones is going to be talking about water slides, but it's a framing tool for looking at how we quantify amenities at our facility. So, what is the um, perhaps the mood or the age demographic or the different people we want to reach with different equipment that we have at our facility. So I don't want you to not come to a session like Friday because you think, well, I'm never going to buy a water slide. If you have the time in your schedule, consider joining us because he's really going to be taking lessons that have been learned from for-profit commercial aquatic facilities which we often think of as water parks or destination pools and applying them for those of us who work in the day-to-day -day nonprofit facilities where we're just trying to make a little bit of cost recovery. So that is coming up on Friday. Also tomorrow, Thursday, March 4th, I will be doing a Facebook Live tomorrow night with Dave Ling from the New Market Stingrays Swim Club. 
So there's no pre-registration required for that. You just need to show up to our Facebook page if you are interested in seeing that live or we will be posting the recording. I'll post the link to our Facebook page directly in the chat box. So I've asked Dave Ling to do a Facebook Live with me because I'm really interested to get some perspective on the experience for our competitive swimmers and our high performance athletes during the last year of the pandemic. So we know that in Canada, swimming pools have been locked down quite a bit. There have been extended closures. It's really disrupted the training pattern for a lot of individuals. And I'm curious to see from a coach's perspective, from somebody who's worked in the competitive swimming side of the industry, what does that look like for the athletes themselves? We know that the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo, Japan, they were rescheduled to 2021, but there are still some questions out in the world as to whether they are still going to happen. What does that look like as a athletic experience? Will these swimmers be able to compete? Will there be a bubble? Will there be spectators? Will there be limitations on what countries are sending their athletes? What countries are willing to vaccinate their athletes, perhaps in advance of other populations that are higher risk? And so we're not going to have all of the answers in a 40 minute Facebook Live, but I did want to talk with someone whose work is living and breathing that aspect of this because I think sometimes us as aquatic professionals on the deck side, the lifeguards, the swim instructors, the aquatic programmers, the aquatic facility managers, whoever you are, we sometimes get frustrated at how demanding our competitive swimmers can be. And now is a good time for empathy because it has been just as much a challenging year for them as it has been for us as administrators and operators. And we could say perhaps even more so depending on their mental health, their physical health and whatever um, training program they had to peak their performance at the Olympics. So that's gonna be happening tomorrow, which is Thursday, March 4th, and that will be happening in the evening. It will be, I'm just checking my schedule here. I believe we have it set for 8 p.m. Eastern, which will be 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. I will make sure that I post a information block up on our Facebook page later today, as well as our Instagram. That's a good way to stay on top of what's happening with the pool aid webinars in 2021. If you're not in the click meeting, you know, if you're not getting the alerts from click meeting regarding, uh, you know, upcoming sessions or links or other, other events you might want to join. So let me post the link to our Instagram in the chat box. It is going to be interesting today. It is 1047. We're about 15 minutes away from starting. Normally we would start to see people trickling in. So it's either going to be a smaller group today or everybody's going to jump in at the last couple minutes. But regardless, really excited. Today's presenter will be excellent. And I know the information will be valuable whether we have five people or 50 people. And as always, these webinars do go on YouTube. So there is the ability to rewatch them to share them with your staff. I've spoken to a number of people in the last year who they either assign a YouTube video to their staff remotely when they're not able to meet collectively for staff training, or they're also uh, perhaps they're broadcasting the YouTube video on a presentation screen in a larger facility. Uh, but so all of these recordings are on YouTube so that you can continue to gain benefit from them and your staff as well. Uh, our guest today, Kathleen Forrestal, has also kindly provided the PowerPoint slides for the session that she will be delivering. So if you are the type of person who'd like to go and download those before you forget or have them open, print them off and take notes, if you're that person, which is totally me, I'm going to put the link in the chat box to today's show notes, and you can go ahead and pull that up on your screen. Uh, welcome to those of you who are coming in. I was just saying we're not sure if, you know, 
it's, it's different to be on Zoom. So I know it'll take people a few moments to figure out where they need to go when their phone buzzes or their calendar buzzes. Let me know in the chat box where you're located, what geographic region. Uh, it's really great to see different people who are joining us this morning. It's a beautiful day here in Alberta. So I hope it's uh, the weather is relatively nice where you are. So welcome, welcome. We'll be starting in about 13, 14 minutes. I've just been recapping the session that we had on Monday. We had an amazing session about increasing accessibility and access for trans youth in public swimming pools. Today's session, as a lot of you know, we're going to be hearing from a partially sighted individual, blind individual, who's going to be talking about their lived experience using pools. And then coming up on Friday, we have a session about water slides. So that's pretty much what's on tap for this week. And then obviously we do still have four more weeks of sessions. So we do have webinars on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday throughout the month of March. We also had our first social last night on Zoom. So those of you who requested that we have the opportunity to network and get to know each other, we had the first social on Zoom, uh, what time was it last night? 5 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Eastern. And there was prizes and games and the opportunity to connect with other aquatic professionals. So if that's something that you think might interest you, those are happening every Tuesday night throughout the month of March. And that is at the request of everybody who came to the pool aid webinars in 2020 and said, hey, we, we want to be able to see each other. We want to be able to connect. And we know that that doesn't happen in click meeting, doesn't happen in this Zoom webinar. And that is a decision that I have made as a business owner for safety, just because there is the potential for meetings to get bombed. And by having a webinar that's secure, where it's just myself as the host, Katie, and then our guest or presenter, we're able to control the content that everybody is sharing. So I see Cheryl is here from Regina, Saskatchewan. Uh, there's an emoji there. So I don't know what the weather is like today in Regina. It is beautiful outside of Calgary. It's probably gonna be above zero degrees Celsius today. Those of you just joining, pop your location in the chat box, say hi, let us know where you're from. Some of your names I recognize, but not everyone. So it's great for me to be able to give our presenter an idea of where you're coming in from. Don't be shy. We're on a different platform, but it's the same format that a lot of you know. So we've got Naomi here from Winnipeg, Manitoba. I see Jared here. Hi, Jared from Beaumont, Alberta. So pop those names in the chat box. We've been talking about the sessions we have this week. I'm going to give you just a quick eyeball on the merch. So all of the pool aid webinars are 100% free to attendees. We don't solicit sponsorship. We don't take manufacturers money. We want to keep these informative, professional and unbiased. Uh, we did offer, we did start offering merchandise this year. Some of you requested, how can you support the webinars? If you have found them valuable or last year, if you found them valuable, we do have some items this year for purchase on our website. So this is my, my Vanna moment. So we've got the mugs. So a lot of you have seen these mugs. It is a campfire style mug, like you might have at a fire camping in the summer. But these are ceramic, so it's a nice 16 ounce mug, great for soup, great for coffee, great for pens. I have one downstairs with my pens. It's got the Lakeview logo. I see Jared loves the mug. He's got a mug. <laughs> so we have a few of these for sale. There's not a ton. I think I have seven or eight left. So if you are interested, let me put the link in the chat box. There is no pressure. We absolutely appreciate your support, but we also understand that this has been a financially devastating year for many of our pool professionals, many facilities. So many people I talked to in the last year, they've had to take layoffs or they've been seconded to other departments. They're not able to do what they love or, um, you know, just, I understand that finances are very challenging. 
So the mug is available for purchase. All prices are Canadian dollars. It includes free shipping and you can see clearly on the links, the breakdown, what pays for the mug and what portion goes to the webinars. We've got these beautiful new patches this year. So this is a Lakeview patch. It's stitched. I don't know how well you can tell that, but this is a stitched three inch patch. So this could go on a fanny pack, a bum pack, uh, a towel, any sort of, you know, a blanket. Anybody else had a Girl Guides or Boy Scouts blanket with all their patches, with your swimming badges. These are made in Alberta. So they are made in Canada. They are made with a local Canadian company. So uh, when you see the price tag $10 Canadian, you think, oh my goodness, that's a lot. It's a made in Canada product. It's shipped straight to your door. A portion covers the patch and a portion will cover, uh, you know, a small donation to the webinars. And for the pool aid webinars, we do have these specific ones as well this year. And this is the pool aid logo that we had done as well as this year is 2021. And we do have a limited selection of the 2020. So in theory, if this project continues year after year, you could end up with a whole, a whole line of these webinar patches. So these are also made in Alberta. And then last but not least, we've got some magnets and stickers with our logo. These are relatively, I think these are $5 Canadian and a lot of that is the postage, unfortunately. So magnet, and then my personal favorite, which is dating myself, cause I'm a nineties child, uh, is pogs. So this is a pog with aquatics 24 seven on the front and our logo on the back. And the reason I made these pogs is I was thinking about challenge coins. My husband was in the US Army for 20 years and then a defense contractor for another 10 years. And they have a tradition in the armed services to provide challenge coins, metal challenge coins for either mementos, specific achievements, teamwork projects. It's the kind of thing you put in your pocket, your change purse, on your desk. And I thought, why not pogs? Kind of, it's a throwback for those of us that remember pogs, or it can just be a little memento. I've been popping them into cards. So thanks to those of you who've been introducing yourself. I see Sean is here from San Luis Obispo, California. I see we've got some people here from Toronto. Got people starting to tick in. Let us know where you're from so I can make an introduction to our presenter. We will be starting in about seven or eight minutes. So a few minutes after the hour, respecting your time and getting started because I know she's got a lot of really, really great slides that I'm super excited to share with you. And we'll start to really see the attendance pick up as people look at their watches and go, oh shoot, it's, it's close to 11 a.m. in uh, Alberta and one o'clock on the East Coast. So I see Jessica is here from Collinsville, Illinois. Ben is here from Toronto. I see Gretna is also here from Toronto. Jennifer is here from Farmington, Maine. Lots more people are joining us. So don't be shy. Say hello in the chat box and welcome to Zoom as opposed to click meeting. We are doing this session on Zoom because it was important to me that we provide, uh, you know, a accessible experience to our presenter. And when we tried using click meeting, not all softwares are made accessible. And I learned that as somebody with, you know, the privilege of being able to see clearly that Zoom webinar was going to be more appropriate for this session. So thanks for skipping over from Click Meeting, joining us here today. It's gonna to be the same format we always have where I'll be introducing our presenter in about five minutes. And just been talking about the different sessions that we had so far this week. Oh, wonderful. I see Tia is here from Newark, New Jersey. Dawn is here from Corvallis, Oregon. Leslie made it in. Wonderful Leslie from Camrose, Alberta. We were having some tech issues the other day, so that's great. Anybody else who's just joined us, please don't be shy. Say hello. We're not going to, we're not going to spotlight you and make you do anything uh, scary. Uh, let me briefly talk about the sessions we had earlier this week. So Monday, we had a great session with uh, Caden Seaburn of the 10 Oaks Project in Ottawa, talking about how to make swimming pools more accessible to trans youth. 
I do have the recording for that session downloaded. I've sent it to a video person who's going to be editing it for me. I'm trying to delegate more this year. I think a lot of you know that last year when I did these webinars, I was very, very busy and working really a lot. So I'm using some assistance this year to try and keep my work-life balance. So we're going to get that recording up on YouTube just as soon as we can, but it's not up yet. So you can subscribe to our channel on YouTube to get a notification of when that will come out. But I would expect it will be the full week until next week when it becomes available. Um, let me put this in the chat box. Wonderful. I see Rachel is here from Okotoks, which is where I'm located, just south of Calgary. I, the other link I'll put in the chat box as people are starting to arrive is the show notes for today. So if you'd like to go ahead and download or open up the PowerPoint presentation, Kathleen has graciously provided that in advance. And so you're able to download the slides if you're the type of person who likes to print them out or take notes you know, screenshots, whatever that looks like for you. Let me post the link for today's session in the chat box. So this year I got uh, smart and I used a shortener for all of our sessions and you'll be able to see that all of our website links have been shortened to pool aid 21, which refers to the year and then the number refers to the day of the month. So today is Wednesday, March 3rd. So therefore today's bit.ly link is pool aid 21-3. So uh, we're going to give people two more minutes and then I'm going to introduce our speaker. Thank you so much to those of you who are here. Please pop your location in the chat box so I can give our presenter an idea of the different geographic representations. I recognize a lot of names, but I do appreciate the reminder where you are located because there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of information in my brain some days. So it's good to see uh, kind of who's who in the pool. I'm just gonna pull up my website and in about one minute, I'm going to give an introduction to the presentation. So I'll be introducing our host, I'll be introducing today's topic, and then I will uh, let them start the session in about one minute. So this is our our kind of last call to get coffee, water, run to the bathroom, grab a snack. Uh, it's gonna be a really great session today. I am gonna be curious, do any of you currently have partially sighted or blind individuals that use your aquatic facility? Type yes in the chat box and you know, are they older, are they younger? Um, is it something that you, you know as a facility that you struggle to access or reach out to these populations? Let us know in the chat box. I'm seeing Anita is here from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Shauna is here from Caledon, Ontario. Carrie is here from Milton, Ontario. Cheryl's here from Bakova in Calgary. Claire is here from Fergus. Claire, my aunt and uncle live in Fergus, which is what are the odds, right? Smaller town. I've got some people saying that yes, they do have blind or partially sighted individuals using their facilities. That's amazing. Larissa is here from Portland, Oregon. And uh, yeah, Anita is saying one, her son has vision loss in one eye. So that's great to have that. Not great that they have it, but great to have that personal experience to inform your work as an aquatic professional. All right, so we've given people lots of time to realize where we are. And so hopefully people will join us. If not, I thank each and every one of you for being here today. Today is Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021. This is the second Pool Aid webinar of 2021. I'm going to introduce our presenter and the session for today and then hand it over to them to get going with a presentation that I am thrilled that they've agreed to give because I think there's so much that we can do in this area. And I'm really, really just, you know, when you connect with someone on the phone and, and it's just like, you know what, it's just magic. So let me introduce our presenter. The topic today is going to be Blind Girls Swim 2, Smashing Barriers to Inclusion in Aquatics. Our presenter is Kathleen Forrestell. Kathleen is the lead for advocacy and community outreach for the CNIB Foundation, Ontario East Region. 
She retired from her first career in alpine ski racing at 21 and is now an accessibility advocate. She loves dogs and is currently working with her second guide dog, Lily. She is passionate about educating people about blindness, inclusion, and barrier-free attitudes, practices, and built environments. So I'd like everyone to give a big welcome to Kathleen in the chat box. I'm going to be going off of microphone and camera. I'm going to be keeping an eye on the chat box and any questions, and we'll be saving a lot for the Q&A at the end. So welcome, Kathleen. Thank you, Katie. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so great to be here with you today. Thank you, Katie, for the opportunity to be here. Um, and I also wanted to say a big thanks to Katie for working with me to make sure this, this experience is accessible. So I am legally blind. Um, I'll explain exactly what legal blindness means in a minute. Um, I have a little bit of residual sight, but I, for all intents and purposes, um, uh, I use a guide dog, uh, and if I don't use a guide dog, I use a white cane. Um, so this is how I identify um, as part of the blind community. Um, so I, ha I live with a progressive eye disease called retinitis pigmentosa. Again, I'm going to speak a bit more about that a little later on. Um, and as Katie mentioned, I am working with my second guide dog, Lily. Um, I am coming to you today from Canada's capital, the city of Ottawa. Um, so I'm going to share my screen really quickly. Make sure this works. All right, so um, I wanted to speak really, really quickly about using the Zoom platform. Um, so as I mentioned, I don't see very well. Um, and I use technology on my computer called a screen reader. Um, the specific program is called JAWS. It stands for Job Access with Speech. Um, and so what that means is my computer is talking to me. Um, it speaks to me what is on the screen, more or less. And um, some websites, some programs work flawlessly with JAWS, um, and some really do not. Zoom is one of the more accessible meeting platforms out here. Um, or that's available today. Um, and when Katie and I tried out click meeting, it was it was horrible. It was an absolute disaster. I couldn't access anything on on click meeting. Um, so thank you again, Katie, for working with me. All right, so let's talk about blindness and swimming. It's not switching slides. Oh, there we go. Hello. Um, so I'm very used to presenting in person. So I thought I would share a few photos. Um, I, that's a headshot of me on the left in the middle. Um, I am also in the habit of describing everything because I work in the blind community. So um, in the middle photo, there is a photo of Lily and me. We are standing on a snowy pathway, um, a fresh snowfall, and we were walking down a trail. Um, and there are trees covered in snow uh, behind us and a cloudy sky and I am about to give Lily a treat. So she is standing to my side and looking um, at me and I have my hand out about to give her a treat. Um, and you can see she's wearing her guide dog harness and it says on it, guide dog for the blind. Um, on the far right, um, there is a photo of, again of Lily in harness. Um, she is also wearing her blue winter coat um, and I believe she's wearing her, pay, her purple um, winter boots. Um, and we were standing at a bus stop on a very cold winter day. So I just wanted to share those few things. Um, so I work for CNIB, uh, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. Um, and our mission is to change what it means to be blind through innovative programs and powerful advocacy that enable Canadians impacted by blindness to live the lives they choose. Um, so CNIB is composed of a few different pillars. We have Vision Loss Rehabilitation Canada, De uh, CNIB's Deaf Blind Community Services and CNIB Foundation. Vision loss rehabilitation provides a whole, a whole scope of um, post sight loss care and rehabilitation um, to enable people to live independently and have the skills they need um, to do so. Uh, Deaf Blind Community Services um, uh, serves a population who have dual hearing and sight loss. And CNIB Foundation is a charitably funded part of the organization. This is the part of the organization I work for. Um, and we uh, kind of do everything that, that doesn't fit within rehab. So we have peer support programs, we have advocacy, which is what I do. Um, we have social recreational programs for our clients. Everything has pivoted to be virtual right now. Um, and we also have technology training because as we know, technology is indispensable, especially in this day and age. 
All right, so a very quick overview. I'm gonna start with a bit of audience participation. We're gonna get into some blindness myth busting. Um, then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my story with sight loss. Um, after that, we'll talk a bit about blindness etiquette, how to interact with somebody who is blind or partially sighted. And I'm going to speak a bit about the sighted guide technique. And this technique is about how you would actually guide somebody who is blind or partially sighted if you are providing assistance to them. After that, after that, I'm going to speak a bit about white canes and guide dogs. Um, as you know, I'm a guide dog handler myself, but I'll speak about both. And then we're going to try and translate all of this to pools. So what about pools? <laughs> all right. So uh, blindness myth busting. Um, I'm going to put some things up on the on the screen. Um, and I'm going to ask you to type in the chat if you think this is true or false. So what do you think? Blindness means you can't see anything at all. And I kind of gave this away a little earlier. Can you hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, so we're getting a lot of responses and the response that I'm seeing, I think, because you gave us a good hint is false, is consistently the answer that we're getting. Excellent. Awesome, let's go to the next one. So you guys are right. Blindness does not always, um, Hang on a second. I think my slides got mixed up. My sincere apologies. Um, so it is false. People see a whole variety of things on the blindness spectrum. Um, this is, I think, the answer to a different uh, Mythbuster. I'm so sorry. Um, but blindness does not always look the same. Um, sometimes people um, see a gray or brown haze. Um, sometimes they'll see bright lights or shadows. It really depends on the person and it's on a complete uh, spectrum. So true or false, when you lose your sight, your other senses get sharper. We'll give people a chance to respond, but we're getting a lot of trues. I know for me, it was true with a question mark. I think it's true, maybe. Okay. And people are not necessarily confident they, their names are associated in the chat box. So I, we do understand that you may not want to even try and participate, which is, which is fair, right? We're here to bust totally these. Fair. Yeah, information may be true. We're not certain for sure. All right, so it's complicated. <laughs> uh, this is not necessarily true or false completely. Um, so blindness does not change how your senses, your senses of hearing, taste or touch biologically work. However, uh, most people who are blind use, learn to use their senses differently to interpret the world around them. Um, speaking for my own personal experience, I am a visual learner, which is I have no idea how that happened in the universe, but I am a visual learner and I live with blindness. But um, as I was losing my sight, I used to see more than I do now. Um, as I was losing my sight, I had to adapt and I had to learn um, how to learn information differently. I had to relearn how to learn. And so um, I learned how to do things auditorily um, and my brain changed and um, not necessarily completely, but you learn. But, a brain is plastic to some extent. And so um, it's funny because to this day, I'll be with people um, and I'll be like, did you hear that? And they'll, they'll have no idea. And it's also interesting too, because I have a little bit of, sight of hearing loss in one of my ears as well. So biologically, um, my hearing is not superior, but I pay attention to it. So this is how it's a bit of a complicated situation. All right, true or false, people who are blind cannot live independently. So definitely getting a lot more answers here that are pretty consistently false. People Excellent. feel confident with those answers. That's awesome. You guys are right. Um, people who are blind can do almost anything. They just do it differently. Um, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a pilot. Unfortunately, that is one of the exceptions to this rule. That is something I am not able to do. Um, so not only uh, can people who are blind live independently, they can do pretty much anything sighted people do. Raise a family, have a, me have a meaningful career, um, play sports. I retired from my first career of ski racing. Um, travel, I traveled independently uh, with Tiffany, my first guide dog. Um, we did a solo trip for, for two weeks in Ireland by ourselves um, and so much more. Uh, so next, true or false, all people who are blind use a white cane or a guide dog. Yeah, so we're getting some falses. We'll give people a chance. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to depend too where people live and 
not um, as much confidence with answers, but the answers we've got are false so far. All right. So you guys are right again. Um, not every person who is blind needs the same to same tools or accommodations. Um, and again, I'll speak a little bit more about my lived experience a, a little bit later on. But for years, I didn't use a white cane or a guide dog. Um, and at that point, I was still considered legally blind. Um, so yeah, everybody uses uh, tools that work for them. Um, and everybody's needs are a little bit different. All right, true or false, blindness means your job options are limited. So we've got some answers coming in the chat box. I know for myself, I put they shouldn't be question mark. We've got some falses. It's true to an extent, true maybe, some yeses. Yeah. Um, right, I, I think we we, we want to be rose tinted, but to a point. <laughs> I love those answers. So you guys are on point once again. Um, it's a little bit of both. People who are blind have successful careers in many fields, like I had mentioned previously. Um, being a pilot was off the plate for me, um, but uh, uh, there are so many options that are available to me. And I think for me, the key is having an employer who is willing to work with, with you. Um, so as I said here on the slide, the only barrier is often an employer's willingness to give blind candidates a fair chance. And unfortunately, there's a lot of, Mis misinformation, misunderstanding out there in the world around what is blindness, uh, what what are people who are blind capable of, um, and there's a lot a lot of stigma. So, um, unfortunately, it can be challenging to find an employer who is willing to hire someone who's blind or partially sighted. I experienced that myself. So, yeah, a little bit of both. All right, true or false? People who are blind cannot use most technology. So we've got some trues, we've got some falses, we've got a lot of slowness to respond. So I think people are thinking about this one. Mm -hmm. We've got some falses, um, but by volume, not a lot of respond respondents. So okay. some technology is advancing, um, some falses, but yeah. I love that you guys are thinking about this. All right, let's uh, get the answer. It is mostly false. So it's another one of those gray areas. Um, so technology is a way of life for people who are blind. Um, that is totally true. Um, I <laughs> rely on technology. Actually, probably one of my biggest frustrations about losing my eyesight is an increased dependence on technology to help me with daily living. Um, I no longer read a, a paper book. It's, it's one of the things I miss a lot, actually. Um, so I listen to audiobooks or I use tech to, text to speech um, software on my uh, computer or my phone. Um, so there is a lot of really great accessible technology out there. Um, by and large, things like iPhones are accessible to people who are blind out of the box. Um, I know somebody who's totally blind and she sets up uh, iPhones for all of her friends. <laughs> Everybody comes to her, she is like the expert. Um, and so it's great that things like that are accessible. Um, that being said, there are some major gaps. And one example um, off, offhand is um, insulin pumps. So diabetic retinopathy is, is a, co a complication um, that causes sight loss that's related to diabetes. Um, and insulin pumps can be essential for people who, who live with diabetes, um, yet they remain largely inaccessible. So, so it's a little bit shocking considering the correlation between diabetes and sight loss that uh, technology these people need is still inaccessible. Um, but yeah, another, uh, another uh, one of those gray areas of yes and no. All right, so let's talk a little bit. Thank you all for your participation and thank you, Katie, for helping me with that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the blindness spectrum. And I mentioned the term legally blind previously. So normal vision is 20 over 20. Um, so I, most of you have heard 20 over 20 vision, I believe. Um, and then there's a spectrum in between normal vision and legal blindness called low vision. And that's from about 20 over 40 to 20 over 190. So what that means is that if a normally sighted person can see something at 40 feet, um, somebody who's blind would have to be at 20 feet to see it. So it's about half distance approximately. Um, and so that's kind of the start of low vision and the end of that spectrum is 20 over 190. So again, you can imagine that's a much reduced acuity. Um, legal blindness is considered 20 over 200. So that's about one tenth of the distance, I think if I'm doing my math correctly. Um, 
or a visual field of less than 20 degrees. And so for me personally, it's the visual field of less than 20 degrees. Uh, it's th that's how I uh, qualify as legally blind. So the average person sees about 180 degrees approximately ear to ear. Um, so you can imagine 20 degrees is somewhere around here. Um, so that's the cutoff for legal blindness. And again, I'll explain my lived experience with that in a little bit. Um, so I wanted to share a few common types of sight loss. Um, uh, these are some of the leading causes, at least in Canada, of sight loss. And so one of them is age-related macular degeneration. Um, and it's the most common cause of, of sight loss, uh, affecting one, approximately 1.5 Canadians. Um, and there are images on this slide, um, and they've taken the same image and overlaid it with an approximation of uh, how th that particular eye condition might impact the person who is seeing this picture. So for age-related macular degen degeneration, um, sorry, I'll go back and I'll describe the photo. So the photo is of two smiling boys. Um, they, are, I'm assuming, are in a backyard. There's a fence behind them. Um, and they're each holding a, a ball. One, one looks like a so soccer ball and one looks like a basketball, I believe. Um, so for age-related macular degeneration, the whole photo is a little bit blurry um, and the center of the photo is grayed out. So um, someone who has AMD uh, lacks central vision but maintains their peripheral vision. Glaucoma is another eye condition um, and it's the opposite and it's kind of like what I experienced. So there is central vision um, but there's no peripheral vision. Um, diabetic retinopathy, which I mentioned uh, previously, um, is a bit of a spotty image. There's kind of these black spots all over the photo, um, and uh, and the other areas are kind of translucent, but but there's a lot of opaque uh, parts of the photo that people that um, you can't see through. Um, and the last uh, eye condition I wanted to mention today is cataracts. Um, this is one of the reversible types of sight loss. Most of the time there is a surgery available to, um, to help with this eye condition. Um, but you can see on the photo, um, there's just a, this general haze and it's a little bit discolored. Um, so that's approximately what um, someone who lives with cataracts might see. All right, so terminology, um, we do not use the term blind exclusively because nine out of 10 people with sight loss are not totally blind. Um, we use per, uh, people first language, so um, uh, people who are blind or partially sighted rather than blind people. And I want to add a bit of a caveat to that because within the disability community, there is not necessarily agreement on this. There are some people who live with a disability who prefer disability first language. I am a disabled person. Um, so uh, I would like to add, always talk to the person and see what language they prefer. Um, and then try to avoid negative connotations. So um, use the term blind or partially sighted instead of something like vision impairment or visual disability. So there's a focus there. Partially sighted is, is on the, on the res residual sight that the person has. All right. So um, I wanted to share a few statistics. Um, so today, and again, this is Canada specific. I noticed in, in the chat, uh, there's some people coming in uh, from the States. I'm sorry, I don't have statistics for you. Um, but in Canada, um, today there's an estimated 1.5 million Canadians um, who identify themselves as having um, sight loss. So this is based on the Canadian Survey of Disabilities um, and the most recent, recent uh, census data. Um, and then furthermore to that, there's an estimated 5.59 million people who have an eye disease that could cause sight loss. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about my story. And again, I've shown you some pictures. Um, I showed you pictures of Lily previously because she's my current guide dog, um, because this is about my story, um, a little bit about my history. Um, I've decided to share photos of Tiffany, who is my first guide dog. Um, Gosh, I think of her and my heart is just still like, I have so much love for that dog, um, but that's an aside. So um, give me one moment to pull up my notes. Oh, I think I've lost my notes. All right, so I'm gonna wing it. Um, all right, so uh, I was born with a 
a progressive, um, it's genetic too, we don't know where it came from in my family, but it's an eye disease called retinitis pigmentosa. Um, when I say it's progressive, that means it gets worse as I get older. Um, I was diagnosed, it was something I was born with. I've been legally blind from birth. So again, now you've got that, that context for what legal blindness is. Um, so the average person sees 180 degrees, legal blindness is less than 20 degrees. Um, that's approximately what I had around um, birth uh, into my mid twenties. Um, now uh, my eye condition has progressed and I see a lot less than that. I have less than five degrees. So it's a tiny, tiny little tunnel right in the middle. Um, if you picked up one of those like jumbo drinking straws and look through that, that would be approximately what I see. Um, my central vision is not perfect. It is good. I am grateful for it. Uh, it it gives me a lot of information, um, but it's not 2020. I, I think it's floating around 2060. I actually wear contact lenses to to um, to correct it to 2060. Um, so uh, yeah, so retinitis pigmentosa. Um, it was relatively stable until I was in my mid 20s. I was living. Um, oh, sorry. I'm going to explain a bit more about RP. RP for short. So in addition to the peripheral vision. Um, it impacts the cells on your retina. So uh, the cells on your retina are called called rods and cones. Um, and so uh, it impacts the rods, which are re responsible for, for peripheral vision. Cones are responsible for central vision and clarity. Um, and your rods, which are your peripheral vision, are also responsible for um, your vision in the dark. So since I was a kid, I've been functionally night blind. I uh, can't see in the dark, can't see <laughs> at nighttime. Movie theaters, not so good. Um, and uh, I have a really hard time uh, adjusting from light to dark. So if I walk into a dark building from outdoors, my eyes will take forever, like probably up to like 15 minutes or so um, to adapt to the lighting level. Um, so that is how retinitis pigmentosa impacts me. Um, so backing up, I was uh, mentioning that it was stable until I was in my mid twenties. And then I was living in Toronto, downtown Toronto, uh, doing my master's at the time. Um, and I had previously decided that uh, I was going to make the, the switch. I was going to adopt the blind identity. I was going to start carrying a long white cane um, when I moved to Toronto. I kind of knew there were some changes happening in my vision. And I was just at this point where, all right, I'm moving cities. Let's just do it. Um, and also, Toronto is a much busier, bigger, um, crazier city than Ottawa. And so um, I figured this is, this is the time to start carrying a cane. Um, and I'm really grateful I had made that decision because shortly after I moved to Toronto, I, uh, I started losing my vision and it went really quickly. Um, so over the first year that I was in Toronto, uh, trying to get through my master's, um, there were these pockets of my visual field that disappeared. Um, and it, it's a strange experience to lose your eyesight. Um, it, you almost don't realize it right away and, until weird things are happening. So I was kind of bumping my head on things that I, I um, shouldn't have been bumping my head on. Um, and when I was out navigating, uh, like from home to school, um, I was constantly being startled. So things I used to see like a couple degrees further out, I wasn't seeing anymore. And so all of a sudden, everything in my environment was sneaking up on me and I didn't know it until it was right in front of me. Um, so that was my experience going through that rapid sight loss. Um, and I'm really grateful it seems to have stabilized to some degree. Um, but after that year in Toronto, I was like, a white cane is not cutting it. I had um, gotten involved with the blind community in Toronto. I had made a lot of friends who had guide dogs. I had met their guide dogs and I was like, wow, you know, these these are not your ordinary typical dog. These are re really phenomenal, wonderful animals. And they, they work really hard and uh, they're so well behaved. And okay, maybe this is an option for me. And so I, I made a really quick transition from uh, deciding to use a cane into deciding to use a guide dog. I think I was only using a cane for maybe a total of two or three years, um, but that was the right decision for me. And so I got Tiffany from a school in California. Um, it's called Guide Dogs for the Blind. Um, I got her in May, 2016. Um, 
about a year after I had applied and um, I was just finishing up my master's at the time on the slide in front of you I forgot to describe the photos but um, the photo to the far right um, is actually a graduated grad graduation photo of Tiffany and me um, we <laughs> I don't even know how we did it, but they got her a cap and gown. And so you can see her in her cap and gown um, with me wearing my gown. Um, you can't actually see, I don't think you can see her harness in the photo, but um, uh, yeah, so uh, she was not happy to be wearing that cap and gown. She's kind of giving a bit of a scowling look on her face. Um, so yeah, Tiffany was with me through graduation. She crossed the stage with me um, and uh, that was uh, that was uh, my experience of getting her. Um, she was unfortunately only with me for about three and a half years. Um, she was a very serious dog, and she um, took her took her work very seriously, um, but didn't know how to relax, didn't know how to shake it off. Um, so the stress got to her, um, and that meant an early retirement. Um, so she retired January last year. Um, and she has been living with my brother in Toronto since then. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk a bit about my the other photos on on this on the screen. So the far left photo, um, that's a photo of Tiffany, Tiffany and myself in Ireland. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we went by ourselves for a two week backpacking trip around Ireland. Um, I had never traveled by myself before in my lifetime. Um, and I decided I've got a guide dog, let's go do this. And it was terrifying. I was like, what did I get myself into? But once I was there, it was one of the most empowering experiences I've ever had. The middle photo is actually when we were in training in California. Um, it was taken uh, on a trail walk that we did through a place called Mir, Mir Woods. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, M-U-I-R. Um, and, uh, and then I already described the, the graduation photo of Tiffany and me. Um, so after Tiffany retired January last year, I uh, went into this pandemic without a guide dog and I was waiting until September and I was immensely grateful that I was able to be trained during the pandemic um, from the end of August into the beginning of September with my current guide dog Lily um, and you saw photos of her earlier. Um, and so she and I have been together since September. Um, it is very difficult finding places to work her right now. I am working from home. Um, and uh, so I'm just doing everything I can to keep up her training. Um, and that's where we're at today. So that is my uh, story with sight loss and my experience with a white cane, um, going through uh, periods of stability um, uh, and then periods of sight loss and the transitions that I've had to make. Um, one thing that's also, I kind of touched on earlier is through the process of losing my sight, I, I had to relearn how to learn. Um, and I, uh, I learned a bunch of new technology, uh, screen reading technology that would speak to me. Um, so as I continue to lose my sight, because that's the reality I face, um, I have these skills that will enable me to continue on doing the things that I need to and want to do. Um, I'm actually going through the process of learning Braille right now as well. So I'm super excited about that. All right, enough about me. All right, so let's talk a little bit about blindness etiquette. So um, blindness etiquette to me is how you interact with how to provide assistance to someone who's blind or partially sighted. Um, so in general, always introduce yourself and do so by name. Um, ask, if, if you don't know something, ask, um, have a conversation. Um, and seek the answer for that particular individual because providing assistance and interactions are not one size fits all um, for the general population. And that also applies to people who are blind or partially sighted. If you are describing things, um, because audio description is incredibly helpful for people who can't see it for themselves, um, please be specific. So pointing and saying over there, not helpful. I do not know over over where <laughs> that is. And so um, being specific is very, very helpful. Um, always address the person directly if they are with a friend or a sighted guide. I can't tell you how many times I've been out with my friends or with my family um, and uh, uh, sales people in stores or, or uh, waitresses at restaurants, um, the general public, they talk to the person I'm with, not to me directly. Um, I can speak for myself, please interact directly with me. Um, 
do not worry about using words like look or see. These are words that I use myself um, and uh, it, it's common language. So you don't need to worry about using that language. Um, and always let the person who is blind or partially sighted know when you are leaving. Um, I can't tell you how many times I have gone to speak to somebody who was with me a moment ago and they've gone and I didn't know they have gone. So um, that's a general overview. All right. So be natural, act like you would uh, with anyone else. Um, speak in a normal tone, speed and volume. Um, address the person directly. I touched on this before. Um, please don't speak to the person they are with. Um, feel free to use site related phrases like see you later or did you watch the game last night? Um, I have different ways of seeing. I will say I was reading that book, but I don't mean literally with my eyes reading, I mean listening. Um, but I don't tend to say I was listening to that book. Um, I will say I saw last night's TV show, um, even though, again, I wasn't really seeing, I was listening to the audio description uh, with that show. Um, be considerate. So introduce yourself by name. Please don't make us guess. <laughs> um, as I was losing my eyesight, my facial recognition deteriorated. Um, and to this day, I can only recognize the faces of people um, I'm very, very familiar with, um, people I've known since before I lost my eyesight or people I see on a regular basis. Um, my tunnel is so small, I don't see the entire face at once. So putting the puzzle pieces together can be very difficult. Um, so please always say, hi, it's Joe. Um, I'll be like, hey, Joe, great to see you again. Um, I don't know if there's a Joe here in attendance. I was not trying to pick on anyone in particular. Um, uh, so offer sighted guide in new, unfamiliar or crowded places. And I will touch a little bit on sighted guide uh, in a moment. Um, and I believe there will be links to the sighted guide videos um, that I'm going to mention in the show notes. So that's a future reference for you if you are interested. Uh, please, please, please do not grab um, the person without their permission. Um, especially in Toronto, I notice this a lot. Uh, people would try to help me by touching me without letting me know that they were touching me or I had people grab my cane, uh, grab my guide dog, try to lead me with those mobility tools. Um, I had people try to grab my luggage to help me onto the TTC in downtown Toronto. Uh, TTC is their transit system. Um, uh, please don't do that. Uh, I can't see very well. I don't know if you're trying to help me or trying to steal my stuff <laughs> and um, it's threatening. So uh, yeah, always announce or, or ask, please. Um, Never, ever, ever pet or distract a working guide dog. I'll speak a bit more about that later. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, please announce when you arrive or leave. All right, so um, be specific. And again, I touched on this before. So when you are describing something, be as specific as you can. So a couple of um, examples of that would be instead of, could you pass that to me? Try, could you pass me the pen that is at your three o'clock? Or instead of have a seat, um, try, let's sit down. There's a chair to your left that is facing away from you. And there's more information about this in the cited guide videos, but this is kind of a, a quick overview. Um, a couple notes about safe environments. Um, push chairs into tables, keep all doors either completely open or completely closed. Anything on an angle is ha hazardous, it's hard to navigate. Um, keep cupboard doors closed. Um, I've made this mistake so many times in my own personal life, uh, left it open and then I don't see or remember that I left it open and then I hit my head or I knocked the door off, and off its hinges. It's not a good, not a good situation. Um, Keep aisles and corridors clear of obstacles, um, tripping hazards if you can't see it, hard to navigate, um, and inform people with sight loss if any objects get rearranged. So um, in their home, in their office, um, if, in a, a familiar environment, maybe they're regular at your pool. Um, if something gets relocated, uh, please let them know. All right, so to summarize, uh, introduce yourself by name, speak normally, um, ask if they would like help, please don't assume. Um, be mindful about uh, features of the environment that help with safety. Um, and when you describe, please be specific. All right, so I mentioned Sighted Guide. What is Sighted Guide? Um, the Sighted Guide technique is a great way to safely and respectfully guide someone who is blind. Always ask before helping. 
um, and let the person actually have a chance to say yes or no. Um, sometimes we will say no. If we do not need help, we'll, we'll decline the assistance. Um, sometimes they may be trying to learn it, um, learn a new environment, and so they need to do it independently. And so um, in, in those situations, they may also decline any assistance. Um, again, do not grab anyone or their cane, dog, luggage, etc., to pull or push them. Um, how to offer assistance. Simply ask, would you like a hand? Can I help you with anything? Um, if you're in a loud or crowded space, a gentle tap on their shoulder or arm um, just lets them know that you're talking directly to them. Um, and again, it's okay if they say no. Um, so I'm going to share an anecdote from my personal experience. Um, <laughs> I was in Toronto. Oh, I have a lot of Toronto stories. Um, so I was in downtown Toronto. I was going to class. I was taking the TTC, the, the subway, to class. And the, the building I was in in Toronto um, was on top of a subway station. So I was in the subway station. It was rush hour. Um, and I was with my white cane. This was before, before I had a guide dog. And um, all of a sudden, I feel a, a hand on my shoulder. And I hear um a classmate of mine say hey kathleen it's adam uh can i offer you any help getting to class and he and i were on our way to the same class um and i was immensely grateful it was a crowded busy environment um and i definitely benefited from the help in that specific environment um but i share this particular story um and i i said to him after the fact not in the moment but I, a couple of days later, I went back to him and I, and I said, um, I was so impressed with how you handled it. Um, he, uh, he did it perfectly in my mind because he did three key things. He identified me um, by touching my shoulder and by using my name. He identified himself um, that it's Adam um, and, I, and I'm in the same class as you, so I knew who he was. And he asked, do you need help? Can I help? Um, and so if you take anything away from this, uh, I, I hope it's those three things. Ask or tell them your name, their name, um, so they know you're they're, that you're talking to them and can I help? Um, I, and for me, that's all the information I need in this situation is that they're talking to me, who is talking to me and being offered the opportunity to ask to, accept or decline any assistance. So in terms of tips for guiding, um, if assistance is accepted, offer your arm by putting uh, the back of your hand on the back of their hand. Um, this is so much easier to demonstrate in, per in person or if I had another human here to assist me, but um, this is why I shared the links to the videos. Um, they will then follow the arm and, and gently grab your elbow. I'm trying to demonstrate, but I'm probably failing miserably to do so. Um, so uh, when somebody is uh, being guided, they will grab the uh, arm just above your elbow um, and they'll follow about a half step behind you and just to the side. Um, and they'll just, they'll walk with you like that. Um, and then as you guys are walking, uh, try to describe things. So, uh, and you can ha have a conversation with the person in terms of how much description they would like, or if there's too much description, they can let you know that as well. Um, but use clear and specific language um, around obstacles, such as ben benches, bus shelters, curbs, furniture, steps, et cetera. Let's move a foot to your right um, to avoid the counter, which is five feet ahead. That's an example of uh, how to provide descriptive um, specific language if you're guiding someone. Um, and if you're describing spaces, again, um, be descriptive. Um, I'm repeating myself, but um, uh, you can explain the layout, for example, indicate where desks or furniture is located, where the washrooms are, um, printers, this is obviously an office example, um, kitchen, including the coffee machine, water cooler and fridge, and any obstacles such as stairs or carpets, etc. And of course, emergency exits. So um, on the slide, there is the link to the video series um, that you can check out for more information. Um, but that's kind of a real uh, uh, crash course in uh, provided, providing cited guide assistance. So everybody knows I'll make sure all of the links on the show notes are updated. There's already CNIB links there as well as some resources Kathleen has already mentioned, but I'll make sure any additional resources are updated in the next couple of days. That's awesome. Thank you, Katie. 
All right, so white canes and guide dogs. Um, so white canes are a very common tool used by people. Um, uh, I've heard white canes and guide dogs be described, um, white canes as obstacle detectors and uh, guide dogs as obstacle avoiders. So um, the way a white cane works is by by hitting things with it, basically. Um, it's not necessarily elegant looking, but that's how the tool works and that's how it's meant to work. Um, so it's also an internationally uh, recognized sign um, of a person who uh, has sight loss. So there are three types of uh, white canes. There are identification canes, support canes, and long canes. Um, so ID canes are lightweight. Um, they're used primarily for identification purposes. Um, they're not quite as much of a uh, tactile tool as a long white cane. Um, they are very compact, they fit in the pocket, um, and they identify you to the public. I had an ID cane for years as a kid that I never used because I didn't want to be identified. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was passing a sighted, um, nobody knew. And uh, and then when I got a long white cane in my hand, I was like, wow, this is the tool I always needed. Um, it does identify me, but it also provides me the practical information that I need to, to more independently navigate my environment. Um, so long white canes are used as probes to sweep or scan the environment, uh, detect object, objects in a person's path, um, changes in the walking surface, and potential hazards like steps or curbs. Um, and as I mentioned before, it is okay to hit things with your cane. That is how it works. Um, and lastly, the uh, support canes, um, they're like a mobility cane, but they have, um, by a mobility cane, I mean like a um, something to physically support you to help uh, balance and and put some weight on it, um, except it's white and red. Um, so it's designed to support a person's weight and provides uh, stability. So those are three types of white canes. Um, and I promise to talk more about guide dogs. So um, the basic guidelines with, with guide dogs, um, ignore them. <laughs> if they're out in public, if they are wearing their harness, uh, ignore them. So if the harness is on, is on hands are off. Um, do not feed them. Um, if you are inclined to offer them water, like say at a restaurant or something like that, always ask the person. Um, there are very um, um, regular feeding and water schedules for many guide dogs, so that's an important thing to know. Um, contain your excitement. Even if you aren't touching the dog, but you're looking at them and, and talking to them and getting excited, that's gonna get the dog excited. Um, they are wonderful, well-trained, amazing animals, but they are still dogs. Um, and there may be a chance to say hello another time. Um, it's really important to know that there is time for play. So guide dogs do not wear their harness at home. Um, they work when they are out in public, but when they are at home, they are basically a pet. Um, they get to play, they get to cuddle, they get to relax, they get treats, they get belly rubs. Um, they, I, I think my dog is probably very, very spoiled. <laughs> um, so uh, big, bold slide, uh, do, not, do not touch a dog when it's in harness. Petting or talking to a guide dog in harness distracts the dog from its job. And this is really important because if the dog is distracted, um, this risks the safety of both the dog and its handler. Um, so I also put on the slide a big, like, don't sign. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. It's a circle with the red line through it. Um, and it says, ignore me. Uh, no touch, no talk, no eye contact. Um, I have a story, again, about Toronto. <laughs> I keep going back to Toronto. Anyways, um, I was crossing a major street in downtown Toronto. This was when I had Tiffany. Um, and we were standing at a curb. I was listening to the audible signal that's at a lot of uh, intersections um, to know when it was safe to cross the street. I also listened to traffic patterns. Traffic makes sound. And I, that's how I know when it's safe to cross. Um, so I was focused. I needed my dog focused and all of a sudden she's turning around to get at something and I don't know what the heck she's trying to get at. And I turn around and I have a little bit, bit of vision so I could see what was going on. Um, and this guy was just behind me on my left hand side. Uh, Tiffany was on my left hand side and he was just petting her back. And of course, if, a, if somebody's petting her, she's going to try and figure out what's going on. 
So I turned to him and I was mad. I was really mad. Um, and I don't think I let it on, but I, I deadpanned. I said, I don't know if you have any concept of how much danger you are putting us in right now. This is probably the worst situation for uh, distracting a guide dog. She and I both need to be focused on safely crossing the street and you distracting us is putting us both in danger. So um, I think that's probably the most uh, threatening situation I've been in when someone was distracting my guide dog. Um, and I tried to let him know that um, while also not yelling at him. Um, but um, it's really important, just don't distract guide dogs. Um, and again, this is Canada specific, but um, I know there is similar legislation in the US and around the world. Um, guide dogs are allowed anywhere their person is allowed. Um, and there's a ton of information on the CNIB website um, with the laws in different regions of Canada. I'm familiar with Ontario laws, but um, there's a link on this slide uh, for more information. So what about pools? <laughs> I've talked a lot about my story with sight loss, the spectrum of, of, of uh, blindness, um, some blindness etiquette, uh, sighted guide, um, guide dogs and white canes. So what does this mean for pools? Um, and I should back up and, and let you guys know, I am not um, someone who frequents uh, public pools. Um, I am incredibly privileged to have parents who have a pool in their backyard. Um, and uh, it's, it's just not something I access on a regular basis. I think since I got Tiffany in 2016, I've been to a pool once. I was uh, facilitating a program uh, for kids who are blind and partially sighted, um, and we took them swimming for the day. Um, and I had Tiffany with me, and I was talking to Katie about this uh, a few weeks ago, and I was trying to remember what, what I did with Tiff. And um, to the best of my recollection, there was somebody sighted um, who was watching all the kids like bags and clothing and stuff like that in a waiting area. Um, and I was in the pool with the kids. And so um, I think I left Tiffany with that person. Um, so she was not on the pool deck. Um, but what would you do if somebody came to your pool and was alone and they needed their dog at the edge of the pool um, for their independence and safety? Um, so I just wanted to throw that question out there. Um, so I wanted to share my experience with, with pools and it is limited. Um, so I'm really excited for this conversation and I'm, ex I'm excited to learn from you guys too. Um, so the three things I could think about um, in advance in, in thinking about accessible pools were staff training and customer service, signage and wayfinding and the built environment. So I'm gonna expand on each of those. So um, in terms of staff training and customer service, ensure your staff uh, receive training around accessible and inclusive customer service. Um, uh, th specific to blindness, this includes uh, providing sighted guide technique, um, uh, using descriptive language, um, and most important, or not maybe most importantly, but also importantly, guide dog access laws. As I said before, guide dogs are allowed wherever the person is allowed. Um, accessibility and inclusion also needs to be part of a culture. So um, it's great if you are kind of checking off the boxes for accessibility, um, but to be really inclusive, it needs to be part of the culture. It needs to be a regular conversation. It needs to be something that everybody is on board with. Um, and, uh, and that starts with you guys. So, um, as I kind of uh, mentioned this mentioned this already, but what would you do if a guide dog handler shows up at your pool with a guide dog? Um, what procedures, protocols would you have in place for accommodating that individual? Um, would your staff know um, where the guide dog is allowed or not allowed? Um, and again, I don't know pool regulations. I just know guide dog access. So th these are just questions that I have for you to think about. Um, and it's helpful to think about them in advance. All right, so signage. Katie and I had also talked about signage and I understand signage is a big thing in the aquatics industry. So um, how is a person who is blind or partially sighted uh, going to navigate the pool facility and access the important information on signs? 
again, just a question for you. Um, signage ABCs, um, and this is actually something I got from a, a um, participant of the CNIB programs in Ottawa. Um, and she always says, um, accessibility equals bigger, brighter, bolder, color, contrast, and clarity. So this is specific to low vision. Um, this doesn't always help somebody who is completely blind, but I thought it was an interesting thing to share, so I wanted to share it. So the other thing to consider is large print and braille. Um, and it could also be helpful to think outside the box. So if somebody who's blind comes into, the, into your facility, there's signage on the wall in different locations, how are they going to access it? Um, if there's braille in the signage, that's great, but how are they gonna know where those signs are to feel the braille? So what about having a handout? What about having like a little booklet or, or um, binder with the information that they need that you can hand to them and say, hey, this is what you need or have a, have a staff member run them down on the rules on the things they need to know to safely access that pool. Um, so always think outside the box and again, have conversations, see what that individual needs um, and you'll, you'd be surprised what you learn. So lastly, I wanted to touch on built environments and CNIB has a really great resource called Clearing Our Path and I shared that website. Um, and it talks a lot about different types of site loss um, uh, and different features of the built environment uh, that uh, can be made more accessible and how to make those things more accessible. So again, I have more questions for you. What parts of the environment are essential I, what parts of the pool environment are essential for safety? How will someone who is blind or partially sighted, um, I messed up the sentence, but how, how is somebody who is part, blind or partially sighted going to navigate those environmental features? So an example I have for you is what about the edge of the pool on the pool deck? Um, is it high contrast? Is it, is it easy for somebody who is low vision to see? Um, is there any tactile element for someone who's completely blind? Um, I would think that would be a really key safety feature. Um, so that was just one thing that I thought of that I wanted to pose to you guys, put out to you guys. And that's all the content I have for you today. Um, uh, thank you again, Katie, and thank you to everybody who's here um, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you um, about my lived experience, about a lot, a lot of information about blindness. Um, I want to open this up to discussion and questions, um, and. Uh, I, I'm available as a resource. So my information is on the last slide and some um, more general CNIB information is on the slide as well. Um, so my email and my work cell phone number are there. Um, please reach out to me if you have questions. Um, I'm always happy to continue the conversation. Um, and Katie, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kathleen. Let's leave that slide up for a few more minutes so people can grab contact information as well as the show notes. I've put those in the chat box where you can find a lot of the resources that were mentioned um, so far during Kathleen's session. I want to give a little bit of background. So I got connected with Kathleen through a mutual friend in Ottawa where I grew up and where she's currently living. And it's interesting because I would say that Ottawa as a city we're, is trying to be very progressive and modern and, you know, like th there's a lot of good things going for Ottawa. But when I tell people that I'm from Ottawa, a lot of one story that a lot of people know about Ottawa is that the city transportation system in Ottawa, when I was in high school, only started adding audio prompts to bus stops and buses after there was a lawsuit by a blind person. And the argument I remember reading in the newspaper at the time was it will cost too much money for the city of Ottawa transportation unit to equip all of these vehicles with um, spoken uh, stops. And I now, as somebody who still goes back to Ottawa, I appreciate knowing where the bus is supposed to stop. And I, I bring that example up just as a framing tool that we in aquatics, I've worked with many clients and I'm sure many of you have had managers or colleagues that have said, well, partially sighted people don't come here anyway, or people in wheelchairs, they don't come here anyway, or why would we go through all this work just to, uh, you know, accommodate one person? It's a charter right in Canada to have access to these facilities. And it's, it's like Kathleen's been saying, we need to look at our legal responsibility in our publicly funded facilities, especially to provide access. 
So I'm wondering, Kathleen, if you can share a little bit your lived experience with maybe other recreation facilities since you don't use pools as much, but what's it been like to try and go to a gym or a fitness class, or I'm assuming it's not always a positive experience and you have to do a lot of research before you go. Uh, yeah, great question, Katie. Um, I also wanted to share that when you're making things accessible or accommodating one specific person, uh, you're making it better for everybody. Um, so it it's a it's a mind shift. It's it's a change of thinking to from accommodation to universal design is really what it is. Um, so you know it's interesting because I. I access a lot pre-COVID. I accessed past tense a lot, um, exercise classes and other fitness studios, um, shopping malls, and all sorts of things. Um, I am very independent. Um, I tend to know what I'm doing and get around just fine. Um, but there are situations that I have to ask for help. Um, so I was taking. Um, bar classes, bar is like a type of fitness, they include like some ballet stuff in it. Um, and I needed an instructor to uh, just describe to me, uh, sometimes a little bit uh, differently or a little bit more specifically, um, what uh, a certain move was in the class. Um, and so for me, this is like looping back to advocacy personally and professionally. Um, and this is something I have a ton of experience in and I'm, I am good at it, but not everybody is. So the conversation really needs to be two ways. It, it's not just on the person to ask, but what can you do to offer? What can you do to make your customer service a built environment, all of that more accessible and more welcoming off the bat? Um, if you build it, they will come. Um, you can advertise that, there, that certain things are accessible. Uh, list the accessibility features on the website. If somebody with a disability is looking for a pool to attend, chances are they're gonna do their research. Chances are they're gonna look around at the different pools in their area, look for information on the website, make a phone call um, to get the information. What features do they need? Do they need a wheelchair uh, ramp? Um, like what, what aspects of it? Um, are going to meet their needs. And so, um, like I said, if you build it, they will come. And uh, and then you're not also just accommodating the one individual, but you're making a more inclusive and um, universally designed space. I'm gonna get you, Kathleen, to stop the screen sharing so it makes your video a little bit bigger for the two of us for our, our attendees. There we go. Awesome. And I want to just comment on what you were saying that I think this is valuable for all aquatic professionals that all staff would benefit from better, more specific communication. I know myself or any other individual who's received confusing directions or imprecise information, we could all benefit from being more explicit and direct and clear. Like you said, you know, go to the right for 10 feet or five meters to the best of your ability um, and guarding, especially there's been a lot of misunderstandings at pools I've worked at where we're not clear and transparent and people make assumptions and then it ends up being really a dangerous situation. Um, can you talk a little bit, Kathleen, about uh, you shared uh, kind of making that decision to go from, as you said, passing as cited to making a decision to adopt a cane. Um, I, that's obviously a significant decision. Can you explain a little bit uh, your experience with that or why it was a, a decision? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So when I say passing as cited, um, and I'm using air quotes, I, I'm in such a habit of describing everything, um, but uh, I didn't look blind. I still don't look blind. Um, if I was talking to you now, um, and you didn't know, you you probably wouldn't know by looking at me that I don't see very well. Um, so I didn't have a visible indicator letting the public know that I was blind or I didn't see very well. Um, and I, I, I go back to, it's a good question, Katie, you've got me thinking. Um, I think it was really the change of city, um, knowing that I was moving, knowing that I was going into a really a uh, busy, crazy downtown environment. I was living at Young and Bloor, if any of you know Toronto. Um, so uh, I felt like I needed that additional safety measure for myself. Um, 
if I look back, I think I had an idea that my vision was changing. I don't think it was really obvious at that point. Um, like I said, the, the big changes happened after I moved to Toronto. Um, but it was a difficult decision. It was like, this is a new identity I'm adopting. Um, I, it's, it's, uh, it's tough. It's a really tough thing. There's a, there's a luxury to passing as cited. Um, but what I found when I started disclosing my disability and, and visibly identifying as somebody who's blind, um, it took a lot of weight off of me as an individual to accommodate myself. Um, and all of a sudden, there were other people who saw that I might be struggling because they could tell I don't see very well. And all of a sudden people were offering. And I was, I was navigating construction sites downtown Toronto and people, construction workers were coming to assist me. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is it, it, I don't have words, but that was what uh, using a cane uh, gave me in addition to the tactile felt sense of my environment. Um, all of a sudden the, the weight of accommodation wasn't on me and other people were offering to help. I want to talk a little bit about what it's like for you to be in the pool. I love that you talked about having clear pathways and open areas around pools. I think this is something that a lot of junior lifeguards especially can be better trained about moving equipment that is, you know, temporarily situated on the pool edge. It's a tripping hazard. It's a water pooling slipping hazard for anybody sighted or otherwise. But when you go in the water, let's say at your family, your family's pool, are you comfortable swimming at the surface? Do you swim under the surface? Can other people be in the basin? What is that like for you? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I, at my family's pool, it's different because everyone knows I don't see and they're aware of that. Um, and they will verbally let me know if there's something I need to know about. So if my dad's jumping into the pool, um, yeah. for example, um, I'm also very familiar with the pool, the shape of it, where the deep end is, where the shallow end is. Um, and it's not huge, right? So I can very comfortably get from one end to the other without a problem. Um, I do, I do dive off of the diving. Uh, that's changed. I no longer run and jump. Um, that's not an option for me anymore. I have to stand at the edge so I know where the edge is and then just do a static dive off of the end. Um, but I still dive. I still go underwater. Um, I do laps. I, I'm a child. I like doing hand, handstands in the pool and stuff like that. So yeah. Um, and then inter go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say when you swim laps, are you at the surface? Like I'm mechanically, I'm just trying to figure this out for myself and it might seem stupid, but like, do you put your face in for your front swimming or are you on yep. your back and your face is out? Yep. I've done front stroke where I, I, I'm not like a pro swimmer in any, in any <laughs> no. sense. Um, but like I'll put my face in and then I'll breathe to, to the side <laughs> and then That's I'll good. do backstroke. I'll do breaststroke. I think those are the three I'm familiar with. What would it be like? So let's say, um, you know, you were coming to visit me, let's say in Alberta, and I wanted to go swimming. What's it like for you in terms of how do you like to map a facility the first time you go? Do you only need the relevant areas? Do you prefer to walk the whole area? What does that look like if we're accommodating somebody who's coming to the first for the first time? That's a great question. And it's going to depend whether they're going to be a, for me. It would depend if I'm going to be a regular or if it's a one-time thing. If it's a one-time thing, I will probably just get help accessing the areas I need to access and then get in the pool. And then once I've um, received assistance, getting uh, to the change room, understanding how to get through the change room and to the pool deck um, and where to, what to do with my guide dog, um, I'll be able to reverse the process when I leave the pool and get out on my own. Um, if I'm going to be a regular at the pool, I might ask for a more thorough, thorough orientation. Um, so I have a better understanding of, uh, exactly where certain features are in the pool. And I, I, like I said, I don't, I don't, um, uh, go to the pools very regularly. So I can't tell you what those other features would be. But I do think it's interesting because certainly, you know, you have the option to swim with your family in the backyard, but I do think it speaks to our industry that. It's not, you know, that when we talked, you came up with one, you, you could remember one instance, but I, I don't think it would be the case if it was an easy process, right? Like I told you that it's, 
they shouldn't have suggested that the dog remain dry and out of the way. Like the dog is not going to go swimming, but the dog should be somewhere. I'm assuming that they, they hear you, they know your voice, they know your body smell and that the dog should be relatively close. And it's, it's awful to me that whether it was, you know, ignorance or, you know, a lack of understanding that somebody thought that pool regulations prohibit an actual guide dog from being on the pool deck. And you mentioned that they are really clean. People might have a misunderstanding about the cleanliness of a dog in this application. Yeah, I think it's also worth noting that accessibility is not one size fits all. So um, I think this is where a conversation with the person to understand what's going to work best for them is going to be key. Because I know for me, um, I was swimming laps in my parents' pool and Lily, my current guide dog, um, got concerned and jumped in after me. Uh, so like, I might need a place to actually tie her down. So when I say tie her down, um, loop her leash around um, a, a fixed object so she can't accidentally jump in the pool or intentionally, but not wanted, not wanting her to jump in the pool. Um, mm -hmm. Or sometimes the, the person might know that the dog will get stressed seeing the person in the pool and they might need a quiet area outside the pool deck to leave the dog. Um, so it, it's really about trying to figure out what's going to work best for that person, for that dog um, and for your facility. Um, but having that openness to having that conversation and, and having options available, um, whether it's just laying at the edge of the pool, no tie down, where there's a place maybe away from the edge of the pool, but on the pool deck where there's a tie down, um, whether it's in a separate room, um, just having those options available and being open to that conversation. And I think for everyone watching to get a really good background and I, and Kathleen, I think you said the video is very high quality. Pick of the Litter is a documentary on Netflix Canada that you can watch or Pick of the Litter is a Disney Plus series. And I really enjoyed it. Just understanding what goes into the training, the selection, uh, more specifically, like how the dog works and, and to Kathleen's point that every dog has its own personality and some are going to be more stressed and more easygoing and how, like you said, it's going to be specific at each facility. Definitely. Um, Pick of the Litter is actually, uh, it's with the school where I got, I got my first guide dog from, where Tiffany's from. So That's fun awful. fact. Can you talk a little bit about what uh, what your personal, obviously not for everyone, but what your preference is when it comes to privacy in the sense of, I worked at one facility where um, if uh, one individual for different medical reasons would come in, we would give them a private area of the change room and they required a certain privacy in the pool lane, which then resulted in me in hindsight as a lifeguard telling other customers, hey, this person with this disclosed condition needs this so I could enforce it. Do you want people to know that you're partially cited? How do you want us to not disclose information that's too much or relevant? What, what would that look like? Yeah, I, again, I think it's about a conversation with the individual. For me personally, it's not it's not a secret. I use a guide dog. Um, so uh, <laughs> on her harness, it says guide dog for the blind. So um, if you look at the sign, you'll figure it out. Um, for people who may be partially cited but not have uh, a visible indicator. They might not use a white cane or a guide dog. Um, it's about asking them. Um, it's interesting you mentioned having a private area because I, if I was going to access a public pool, I think I would feel a lot safer knowing that there was a part of the pool that I could be in and not worry about bumping into people. Um, that's exactly it. And I think that's an, a relevant piece for everybody who's here to consider is having policies in place or practices. So this was at the University of Toronto, and I can't speak to what it's like now, but we had two individuals, one who had a medical condition where if she was touched by someone else, accidentally or intentionally while lap swimming, she could have seizures. And so we were required to blockade and monitor her specific portion of lane. And there was a lot of pushback from people until they understood that she'd been swimming at this pool for like 22 years, every day at the same time, uh, you know, paratransit had a standing stop. But then we did start to have some pushback from clients who felt that they were also entitled to the same type of accommodation. And it's, it's really challenging to administer equity issues, access issues, as well as legal issues. So 
I, yeah, if you had a dedicated area, would that make you more comfortable swimming at a public pool in Ottawa? Or would that not change it for you? Yeah, I think that definitely would change it for me. Um, just knowing that I have that safety area basically is what it is, it would make me more comfortable. Um, you raise a really valid point though about once one person has an accommodation, other people are requesting the same thing. And from an admins, a service provider administrative uh, perspective, that could be very difficult. Um, I think I think public education helps in this in those situations where um, for me it's no issue if things are disclosed because I use a guide dog, but somebody else might want more discretion around around their lived experience. And I think in that situation, um, informing the other um clients is that what you use uh, it depends on the person patrons okay. bathers clients yeah swimmers. okay we'll, we'll, we'll say clients uh the other clients for your pool um just informing them that this is a disability required accommodation um this is not special treatment she's not a vip it's a disability accommodation um uh i think maybe that would just help clarify things yeah, no, I agree. And I think that's where it's important for everyone, whether you're in Canada or the US, to get to know your legislation in your area and reach out to different advocacy groups to understand clearly what is a regulation, what is the law you have to follow, whether it's accessibility or individual charter rights or freedoms, and what is an organizational standard or best practice that you endeavor to administer so that you and your staff also at the junior level, right, those junior guards that might make mistakes if they don't understand, they know what your facility is about and they know what you're doing. Um, I want to let people know that if you have any questions, please do feel free to throw those in the chat box. I'm just running through the last couple questions that I have, and I do want to make sure we accommodate your questions if you have them. There was a question from Tia about your experience with public pools, and I know we have we discussed previously Kathleen doesn't have a ton of public pool experience, but I wanted you to share a little bit about bathrooms, because I know we all have bathrooms at RIC facilities, and I didn't realize how challenging they are until we started to talk about bathrooms. <laughs> So very good question. Um, even pre-COVID, um, a bathroom is not a place that you want to be touching, especially a public bathroom. Um, and as someone who's blind, I rely on my, my sense of touch to navigate my world. Um, I don't always see where things are, so I end up feeling for where things are. Um, so um, this is a huge barrier with COVID. That's a whole other conversation. But in terms of public bathrooms, having some consistency in terms of the location of things. So um, that's so difficult because every built environment has different features that require things, things to be located differently. Um, but like having, I don't know, like let's say if all soap dispensers could be on the wall to the left of the sink, then you would roughly know where to feel for the soap dispenser. Um, so in in lieu of having all built environments be identical, um, maybe there's an opportunity for informing the, the swimmer who is blind or partially sighted of the location of things. Tell them in advance, or um, there's actually technology out there. Um, you could actually use a QR code, which is relatively mainstream technology. Um, and you could always like post the QR code right at the handle of the doorway. Um, and then just tell the person there's a, there's a QR code description of the layout of the bathroom, of the layout of uh, whatever room they're entering so that they can independently then access uh, that information on, on an as needed basis. They don't have to go back to you every single time for to re-explain where things are. Um, but just providing that description, providing that uh, inf information up front so that minimizes the groping around a public bathroom that is not always somewhere you 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 want to be feeling around well and i think to that point it's important for facilities whether you're aquatics or recreation in general or public facing anything to really think about those frontline staff and making sure we're including them in training because i know as a you know privileged sighted able-bodied customer i've been to facilities where the customer service rep is, like you said, Kathleen, pointing in a general vicinity that I don't understand and saying it's that way, but they don't have the staff capacity to walk with me and they don't have the training to provide more detailed information or a handout with a map. 
And so I think that's often a pain point that we as management get stuck dealing with on the back end because the customer has had a negative experience. Their needs were not met. And so I do think when we're thinking about these systems, I know there's, you know, do more with less money and COVID and budgets, but we really do need to think how, how would we accommodate any person with a specific need coming into our facility? Maybe they don't speak English. Do we have pictures? Maybe they're partially sighted. Do we have these descriptions, QR codes? Can we do something that meets both needs, right? Is it, you know, I've seen facilities doing a lot of video tours that might hit a non-English speaker, but that doesn't meet the needs of somebody who's partially sighted. So really auditing your facility, what would the experience be like? Would you know where to go? Are there arrows, are there traffic patterns? Now with COVID and budgets and grants is a great time to kind of roll two things together because traffic patterns matter for COVID, but I'm assuming Kathleen, you, you probably have a pattern that you follow when you move through a space. Does, or do you, are you comfortable moving all around now that you have Lily? That's a really great question. So if I'm understanding the question, uh, do I follow specific patterns when I'm navigating outside Yeah, if you go to home? the grocery store, do you always go up and down the aisles or are you comfortable to go to produce and then dairy and then check out? Like, do you have a routine or you just kind of go with it? Depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so typically I have a pattern. Okay. Um, and Lily has been trained to find specific things for me in the grocery store, which <laughs> she really loves. So like, I can tell her, go find the cheese, for example, and she loves finding cheese because it smells really good too. Oh, so awesome. um, so like we do have a pattern, we'll go to one spot, then the next, then the other. Um, and she's also learned that routine as well. So she knows what to expect and where we're going next. Okay. Yeah, so just getting, and I don't have all the answers either. It's just getting our remaining participants to think about these couple of things. Uh, last call for questions. I'm answering the last couple of questions. Sorry, I'm asking the last couple of questions that I have. I have two remaining. The first is not a pool question. I'm curious as a former downhill skier, what, is, what was the experience like for you as a skier? I can't even comprehend bombing down a mountain on waxed, you know, skis <laughs> without, you know, knowing exactly where I'm going. Yeah, uh, I skied with a guide. So um, I was uh, in a partnership um, and my guide would ski ahead of me and we had headsets within our helmets um, so we could talk to each other. And I had more vision than this was over a decade ago that I ski raced. Um, and I had way more vision than that I do now. Um, so I honestly can't imagine trying to race now. I'm sure I could do it, but uh, it would be different and I would have to learn how to do it a little differently. But at that point I had enough vision to follow my guide very closely and see what they were doing. And I would watch their skis and see how their skis were reacting to the snow to gauge what the train was like, because I don't have depth perception. So white, white snow just looks white to me. I can't see any variation in it. Um, so I watched their skis to see what their skis were doing, but I also relied on what they were telling me. So they would explain things to me if it got icy, if it got uh, steep, if there was a bump, um, if there was a sharp turn, all of that stuff was communicated to me through the radios. Um, that's how I skied. Um, now that I ski recreationally and I haven't been on a big mountain in years, I only ski in the Ottawa area and it's like 30 seconds from, from the top of the hill to the bottom. Um, I still ski with guides. Um, I would never go skiing on my own. That would not be safe. Um, I'm good with the hill. It's avoiding other people <laughs> and obstacles that I'm not so good with. And so, um, yeah, I still ski with guides, but sometimes they ski behind me. Um, and again, we'd have headsets so they can tell me if there's anything I need to watch out for. Um, but I love, I love skiing. Yeah. That's amazing. So my last question, because I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat box, but you have, you know, 30 seconds if anybody has one is Kathleen, you've given us a lot of great strategies in the PowerPoint that people can download on the show notes. So thinking about signage, understanding, like even what you were saying, the whiteness, and I'm thinking of all these facilities that are all white walls all white change rooms, even I find the space, you know, hard to perceive the walls and, and I have full vision, right? What that must be like when we, you know, accent walls are going away, but maybe they serve a purpose for certain individuals. But if you can think off the cuff of any um, immediate strategies or advice you'd give an aquatic professional and they're thinking, oh, geez, I don't have a ton of money. I don't know if I'm going to get a lot of support to start doing things. 
Mm-hmm. Where should somebody start if they have to do one thing or one small thing they want to try and accomplish? Ooh, um, I feel a little out of my depth in answering that just because I'm not super familiar with what environmental changes um, are possible in a pool. Um, within the built environment, high contrast is key. So if there's a white wall and a white floor changing one or the other, that would be awesome. If there's a blue pool and a blue pool deck, not great. Try and change one or the other. And I don't think you can change the, the color of pool water. So, um, and then customer service training is maybe not free, your, your manpower hours, but um, there are resources out there. I'm a resource. Um, there's information on the CNIB website um, uh, to, to train your staff in, in more accessible customer service. And I think if all else fails, uh, customer service really bridges that gap um, when when there are features of the environment that aren't working. That's awesome. I think that's really great. And I really appreciate, Kathleen, the time you've taken with us today. And we've got this recording. It'll go up on YouTube in about a week. So anybody should feel comfortable that they can share it with staff. They can play it in the future in a group environment. And I think the perspective that you've brought to aquatics has been really, really helpful to me. And I thought, you know, I think I've seen a lot of things or I understand a lot of things, but every lived experience is so different. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Anybody have any comments or thank yous they'd like to put in the chat box? I will read those out to Kathleen. Um, Thank you so much to everybody who's been here today. I really, really appreciate the feedback. Um, We'll I'll be on here for about 10 more minutes doing a post show. Don't forget, Kathleen, too, we'll have you switch me over to host. Yep. Uh, some of the feedback we're seeing in the chat. Thank you so much, Kathleen. This was so helpful. An excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, Amanda's saying she learned a lot and will be in touch. So we'll make sure that her contact information is available. Awesome and informative session, Kathleen. Thank you so much. So lots of feedback. Very helpful presentation. We've still got 25 people here. So loved hearing individual learned experiences. Thanks for sharing yours, helping us grow as professionals. Thank you for the information. So I know this is going to have a a significant impact in terms of the reach that we all have with our staff and our facilities and our regions. So thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. And thank you all for for you. Thanks to all of you who attended today. Um, This is a new experience for me talking to the aquatics industry, and it's been wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our upcoming sessions. Kathleen, you're welcome to stay or go as long as I'm the host. I just switched you over. Fabulous. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Didn't want it to close. Bye-bye. So just a couple of notes on our upcoming sessions. So thanks so much, everyone, for sticking with us today. Uh, Today is Wednesday, March 3rd. We have a session coming up on Friday, Wednesday, oh geez, not Wednesday, Friday, March uh, 5th, and that's going to be about water slides. I'm going to put the link in the chat box. Tomorrow night, Thursday, March 4th, I'm going to be doing a Facebook Live with Dave Ling regarding um, competitive swimming and the COVID pandemic and what that looks like for our Olympic athletes and what that experience has been. So if you don't follow us on Facebook, you can hop onto Facebook tomorrow night or look for the recording later on Friday. I'll just put a couple links in the chat box. So that's gonna be coming up tomorrow night, Thursday. I'll be putting all of that information up on our social media. Show notes for today, you can also find on our website. The recording will be there when it's available. It's going to be about one calendar week to get that up for everyone to access taking a little bit more work-life balance this year. So the video will not be up in two days. It will be closer to one week. Registration for Friday. I'm going to pop that link in the chat box as well. And then next week, we'll have a whole new set of webinars. So look for those. We're going back to click meeting. This is our only Zoom webinar. Uh, We've got the merchandise available for purchase. If you'd like to support the pool aid webinars, That is directly on our website. I will put that also in the chat box. And I want to say a big thank you to everyone who came out today. I appreciate your time. I know you have a lot of places to be and things to do, especially those provinces that are still in lockdown but have announced that changes are coming. So thanks so much for spending your Wednesday with me. 
if you have any questions, I will be on here for a minute or two and I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, have a great rest of your Wednesday and we'll see you this time on Friday if we don't see you on Facebook Live tomorrow night.